Before we take our look at uh, Philippians 1, part 2, please join me in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who indwells each and every one of us as the illuminator of your word. We ask for your gracious, holy help in understanding your word. Today we'll be talking much about the gospel and much about practical living as a Christian. And we ask that you would help it sink deep into our hearts and minds and help it to, to grow there, inspiring us and educating us and convicting us as we challenge, are challenged by your word to be people of the gospel, uh, freely sharing your gospel with everyone you put around us. Uh, bless our time together in your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We started a new sermon series last week, Philippians, and uh, we only got partway through Philippians 1, so we're picking up where we left off last week in Philippians 1, verse 12. And this is uh, really going to be talking about the, the march of the gospel, and it's going to be talking about Paul and his uh, particular circumstance he finds himself in, and how through that circumstance, uh, the gospel still advances. So in verse 12, it says this, I want you to know, brothers, and just a quick reminder, this is Paul writing while he's in Roman captivity. And he writes this, letters, this letter saying, I want you to know, brothers, and these are the brothers and sisters in Philippi, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And just those three verses there, Paul has outlined what, that what has happened to him has actually been a blessing. The world would look at it and say, oh, what a failure. What has Paul done? Why is he in prison? This is all God's plan has fallen apart. No, no. Paul points out that what has happened has actually been for the advancement of the gospel. So this is one of the, this is one of the problems that the Philippians might have been dealing with. They might have been saying, what is, what is going on? Is Paul outside of the will of God? And is that why he is finding himself in prison? Paul knows this, so he wants them to know that what's happening to him is completely within the will of God. And on top of that, God is using it as a blessing. As a blessing in the proclamation of the gospel. The gospel, because of Paul finding himself in this situation, the gospel can be presented in a very unique way that could not have been so if he was not in that situation. We're not surprised that Philippians would wonder if the power was in God and with Paul because he is imprisoned. And so Paul takes that and turns it on its head and says, actually, the power of God is prevalent and is seen in my very imprisonment. God is using this imprisonment for his glory and the good of those whom he will save through the gospel. So this is no hindrance. That's what the world would look at and be like, oh, Paul's being hindered. No, no, this was not a hindrance in God spreading his gospel message through Paul. Instead, it really creates opportunities that could have never been possible if not God allowing this to happen this way. This all turns out for the growth and the march of the gospel. You also have to remember that during his imprisonment, Paul had the time to write other epistles, other letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians, not just the Philippians. And we know what a great product that was that God used to bless his church. So none of this that Paul was experiencing was wasted. None of this opportunity at all was wasted by God. It was all used to its utmost to share the gospel with even the Roman imperial guard. Even the household of Caesar we read later. And all these wonderful letters that 
God was able to breathe out through Paul for the growth of his church. You notice here that in, in this entire letter, you will not notice any part where Paul has a concern about his benefit, about his rights, about his growth or his advancement. He doesn't talk about that at all. He doesn't talk about that. His passion clearly is for Christ and the advancement, the march on of the gospel. That is what he is focused on. He doesn't sit there and say, oh, woe is me, my back is sore, this is cold, and this is that, and this is... No, he, it's so clear that even in spite of his imprisonment, that his, his goal, his focus is the advancement of the gospel. He says that it has become clear to even the whole palace guard, even the whole Roman imperial guard, that he is in chains for Christ. He's not just another prisoner. He is an ambassador of Christ. And that is why he's in his chains. He, he was living his faith out for all to see. He didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk. And then he talked. His witness led to the conversion of many within Rome. So he was not in any kind of a positive circumstance whatsoever. He did not need everything to be, every track greased, everything easy in order to be fruitful in his ministry. He just brought glory to God in any circumstance he found in himself in. He brought glory to God. And we can do the same thing. No matter what situation you find yourself in, you ask yourself, how can I glorify God? How can I share his gospel in word and in deed? Verse 14, Philippians 1 says, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Did you hear that? Here's another blessing that God gives the church through Paul's imprisonment. Paul's imprisonment gives the Christians who are around him courage. Courage. A, a, a certain kind of Christian valor and boldness. They, they were given confidence. They are not imprisoned, but witnessing Paul in prison and how he was carrying himself in the Lord gave them confidence and courage. I think as the days get darker, and especially in the last two years, it, it, it should be fairly obvious to every Bible-believing Christian that now is a time where you need courage. More so now than ever. And so it is, it is a powerful thing to see someone witness the gospel as a prisoner. To see someone being persecuted and still sticking to their guns with courage and valor. And confidence. No fear of imprisonment. No fear of death. This is a powerful thing. So when you look around and you see someone like that, it bolsters your own confidence and your own courage, doesn't it? And you're much more bold to share the gospel, not fearing any reprisal. Instead, you find yourself in the midst of this trial full of joy and rejoicing your situation. That's what Paul's doing. He's really rejoicing in his situation and giving God glory for the situation that he's in, which is imprisonment. Paul had joy in the midst of his imprisonment because he saw God was still at work and he saw how God could use him even in the midst of imprisonment. And so you can have a faith and a trust in God that he will take care of you no matter where you find yourself. He will always be faithful. And the believers around Paul in the church of Philippi and all these other people around him in Rome see that Paul's God is faithful to him and is using him in the midst of him being under house arrest and imprisonment. We need that message today so that we can be full of courage and confidence 
in spite of whatever situation you find yourself in. It didn't change Paul's mission at all, did it? When he was free, he did the very same thing he did when he was not free. Same goes for us. What do you do? You preach the gospel. You share the gospel. You live for Christ. You glorify God in all that you think, say, and do. You, you, you get into His Word. You grow in His Word and in obedience and faithfulness to His Word. That's what you do. That's what we do. That does not change no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. I remember when COVID first started and everybody was, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And it's, I wrote out a whole list and I laminated it and threw it on the doors and if you read that entire list at the very end it said in short what you do is what we have always been doing you always assemble for the church you always assemble as believers you always do that you always pray for your brothers and sisters and check in on them you always be in prayer for one another and for the leaders of the church and the leaders that god has installed around the country and the world all, everything that we you always study your word, your Bible. You always, everything that we should always be doing was the same stuff that we kept doing, right? There was no change. There was no change. And it's the same here. No matter what circumstance you find yourself in, you continue. Your orders do not change. Philippians one verse fifteen. A little bit of a of a shift here. Paul has been talking about the gospel and the advancement of the gospel. And now he, he takes a, a little turn here. He's still talking about the gospel, but in a different way. Verse 15, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. And the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? In other words, Paul has stated these two verses. And he says, what then? What should we do with this? He says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Some are preaching out of envy and rivalry. Some are preaching because they want to see themselves and be seen as greater than Paul. They want to see their name in lights higher on the billboard marquee than Paul's. And some people preach for that reason. Such people were happy that Paul was in prison because, you know, such a person is going to think, now's my chance. Paul's in prison. This is good because now I can get out there and my name can gain an edge over his So, in reality, they're motivated by envy, rivalry, competition. You see that in preachers. Many times I've talked to other preachers and almost, almost immediately after a friendly greeting comes, how many people were at your service this Sunday? Right? Right? How many people have you baptized in the last six months? How, many, how about this? How about that? You know, not in a spirit of I really want to know so I can praise God along with you, brother, but in a spirit of competition. Almost a spirit of, of jealousy is at work here that Paul sees happening. Paul wasn't cynical. He was not critical of other preachers where he believed that every other preacher was bad and had bad motives and ideas he wasn't that kind of guy he mentions that some do preach out of rivalry some do preach out of a desire to be themselves glorified but he also mentions that some do preach from good will the same kind of attitude that paul has some preach out of selfish ambition that's the wrong motive which causes them to serve, but they're serving insincerely. This is a, a bad form of ambition. This is not the good kind of ambition where you want to do something for the glory of God, but the selfish kind 
where you're looking to find success for yourself. They don't care about the advancement of the gospel so much as they care about their own personal advancement. So such people are going to look at Paul's imprisonment and say, now's our chance. Now's our chance. And they're going to take that opportunity and they're going to even double down and say, well, you know, Paul is great and all, but the reason why you should listen to me instead of Paul is because obviously Paul has been sinful because the Lord has allowed him to be imprisoned. You and I understand that that is false, right? That just because God allows something bad to happen to somebody doesn't mean that they're sinful or that they're being chastised. You remember when the apostles are with Jesus and they see the blind man and they say, Lord, what has this guy done? Has he sinned or has his parents sinned? And Jesus says, neither. This man was, bl was blind for, so that God might be glorified. The same is, for, is true for Paul's imprisonment. He is in prison so that God might be glorified. But those who only have selfish ambition are going to take this opportunity and try and use it to drag down Paul. Not to lift up Christ or to lift up God, but to drag down Paul so that they themselves might have self-advancement. And these people, Paul likens it to having someone add affliction to his chains. So those who are coming at the gospel, who are preaching Christ from a bad motive, Paul says, are adding affliction or pain or weight to my chains. They don't want to win just for themselves. They also want to see Paul lose because that will help them advance. You see, it's selfish ambition. Paul does not have any kind of thought about this. Paul, when Paul thinks about the gospel, he's not thinking about how can I be better than so-and-so at preaching the gospel? How can I have a more effective ministry than such and such? Paul doesn't have that thought at all. At all. I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. Let me read it to you. It's a little long, but I think it's worth it. This is a rebuke of a competitive attitude amongst ministry folk, amongst pastors. Amongst men of the Lord. Dear Lord, I refuse henceforth to compete with any of thy servants. They have congregations larger than mine. So be it. I rejoice in their success. They have greater gifts. Very well. That is not in their power nor mine. I am humbly grateful for their greater gifts and my smaller ones. Do you ever hear that anymore? Do you ever anybody pray the prayer? Lord, this man has obviously been blessed by you. Let me serve him so that I can serve you through him. I'll carry his books all my life. If you don't hear those kind of humble prayers anymore. He continues. I only pray that I may use to thy glory such modest gifts as I possess. I will not compare myself with any nor try to build up my self-esteem by noting where I may excel one or another in thy holy work. I herewith make a blanket disavowal of all the intrinsic worth. I am but an unprofitable servant. I gladly go to the foot of the cross and own myself the least of thy people. If I err in my self-judgment and actually underestimate myself, I do not want to know it. I purpose to pray for others and to rejoice in their prosperity as if it were my own. And indeed it is my own if it is thine own. For what is thine is mine. And while one plants and another waters, it is thou alone that giveth the increase. Isn't that great? Humility. Humility. I love what Paul Washer has said. There are no great men of God, only sinful, wretched men that God has raised up and saved by grace alone. That It's God who gets the glory. It's God who has the power. It's God who gives the increase. 
So after all this, Paul says, look, the way I feel about it is that whether it's fake and for self-ambition or whether it's preached in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. In other words, they were, they saw, a lot of these guys with the selfish ambition saw this as their chance that Paul's in prison and now it's my chance to really shine. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to preach the gospel even more. So it's the wrong motive, but it gets the result that Paul knows is good. The motive is wrong, but they're preaching Christ. At least they were motivated to do that, even though it was the wrong motive. Paul is concerned not with just the content of the gospel being preached, but with the motives as well. But God, God can use bad places or bad motives in spite of themselves. Many, time, many of us know people who go to churches that are not biblically correct, that God is not pleased with. Biblically speaking, they do not match up to the mandates that are outlined for what a church should be or what a pastor should be. Yet we have all known people who have been saved in spite of that in those very buildings. Paul is very concerned with the, the gospel being truly preached, that it's not a false gospel. I, I want to make that clear, that Paul is not saying, well, if somebody just goes up there and throws out the name of Christ, I give him a thumbs up even if his motive is wrong. Paul's not doing that. Don't be... Uh, confused there. I would point you to Galatians 1, verses 6 and 9, where Paul says, if, if anybody comes to you with a different gospel, let them be anathema, which is the word for damned. This is a powerful word. If anybody comes to you with a different gospel, anybody, let them be damned. Throughout all this, Paul's concern is the gospel. It's the gospel. It's glorifying Christ through the gospel. And he had joy in spite of everything that we just talked about, in spite of all these critics, in spite of being in prison. Paul found a way to have joy. There's a difference between happiness and joy. You can have joy in any situation when you look at things through the same lens that Paul is. You can't necessarily have happiness in every situation, but you can have joy in every situation. Paul doesn't care who receives the credit. He just wants to see Christ preached and God glorified. And you can tell such people, can't you? You can tell such people. They don't want the limelight. They don't need it. They're not looking for attaboys they're not looking for more Instagram likes. They're not looking for more uh, Facebook hearts. They are just going about the business of the Lord day in and day out faithfully. And that's it. And if somebody else is, is glorifying God, well, you should be happy about it if you love God and want to see Him glorified. And you find that somebody else is glorifying God and God is using them in a way different than you, it shouldn't make you sad. It makes you happy. Yeah. I love seeing God glorified. I love hearing his gospel preached, but preached rightly. Paul, Paul is basically saying, if, as long as you're preaching a, a true gospel, I don't really care what your motives are. Because the holy almighty God is going to deal with you on that. He's going to deal with you on that. But at least the gospel is preached. In the same sense, if you preach a false gospel, it doesn't matter how good your motives are. Make sense? Preach a true gospel, doesn't matter what your motives are, God will deal with you. Preach a false gospel, and it doesn't matter how good your motives are. You must preach the right gospel. God's work is getting done, even with Paul in prison. That should make you stand back and say, wow, our God is so great that nothing stops his work 
from getting done. It will always get done. God wants his gospel preached. He wants Paul to reach out to the Gentiles. It's going to happen no matter what happens. Because ultimately God is sovereign and in control of everything. And that is cause for rejoicing. Philippians 1 verse 19. Yes, Paul says, and I will rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Man, Paul understands that God is sovereign. That means he is in complete control. There's no such thing as 92% sovereign. If you're sovereign, it means you are 100% in control of everything. So Paul is looking at his current conditions. He's in prison awaiting uh, uh, an audience with Caesar, who is Nero at the time. Not a great guy. But in spite of all this, he has courage. He has hope. He has joy. Because he knows that God has him exactly where he wants him. And all he has to do is follow through with what God has already told him to do. It's the same with us. You find yourself in a particular situation. You say, I don't know what I should be doing. Yes, you do. You should be doing whatever the gospel tells you to be doing. Right? That hasn't changed. Your marching orders haven't changed in spite of whatever circumstance you find yourself in. It's, living the Christian life is hard, but it's also simple. What should I be doing? It's already in the Word what you should be doing, right? I should be forgiving others as I myself have been forgiven. I should be helping to tell the Gospel that glorifies Christ. I should be doing that and teaching them everything that Christ has commanded. And then baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I should be guarding my tongue. All these things, right? I should be studying God's Word. When I sin, I should be asking for forgiveness so that He might cleanse me from all unrighteousness. We know what we should be doing. And that stays the same no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. Paul here mentions that he has confidence because he knows he's being prayed for. He knows he's being prayed for. Not just what, find, what he finds joy and confidence in isn't just the greatness of God, but also the fact that he knows he has other believers praying for him. That's why prayer is so important. We can never pray too much. That's why we have such an emphasis of prayer here in this church. He says, through your prayer and through the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So it's not just the prayer, it's also the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul's needs are being met not just through faithful people who are acting on behalf of Jesus Christ, but faithful Jesus Christ Himself. Meeting all those needs and being providing for Paul's every need. He says, this is my earnest expectation and hope. That's Paul expressing his faith. I have faith that God will meet all these needs. What a wonderful thing. Don't forget, he's in jail. Would you yourself have that same kind of faith to be able to have confidence and joy and rejoice in your present situation in spite of of all this, Paul knows that God's not doing this to punish him. Far from it. He's giving Paul the opportunity to serve him and to glorify him, right? And in a mighty way, in such a way where it will bring courage to other Christians who see him imprisoned and see him rejoicing and see him trusting in the Lord. And they themselves will find the same courage that Paul has. And that will also help the gospel of Jesus Christ to continue to flourish and grow. Paul was in prison because it was God's will. People love talking about purpose and destiny. It was God's destiny 
for Paul to be there. God is sovereign, which means he's in control of everything, which means that God purposefully allowed and made it so that Paul would be in prison there for such a time as that. You are where you are at for such a time as this. God has you perfectly, strategically positioned exactly where he wants you to be, and there is no small roles. There's no small roles. Who are you to tell God, God, you know, uh, this is great and all that you have me here, but, you know, it's a little beneath me. I mean, shouldn't I be doing something a little bigger? We don't say that to God. You don't know the ends of all things. You don't know how he's going to use you. He has you in the perfect place at the perfect time to be in his will and to put forth his will, to share the gospel, to pray with others, to be a godly influence and proclaim the gospel of Christ so that those that he has put around you might also be saved and taste the grace of God as you have. And so he says, all this, that Christ might be magnified in my life or in my death. He, he wants to be set free. He wants to be able to go and visit the Philippians. He wants to do all these other things. But at the same time, his biggest concern is that he glorifies God, whether he's released and free, or he glorifies God in his death. That's his goal. That's his dream. Notice his dream has nothing to do with him. Nothing about this says, Lord, I'm happy to serve you. I just really hope that I can have a house, a white picket fence, two and a half kids, a cat and a dog. Really hope that I can have that. Nope. Doesn't talk about that at all. He doesn't live his life for himself anymore. That's what you used to do. That's what Paul used to do. Now we live our lives for Christ and Christ alone. And that is where we find completeness. And that is where we find joy through service and obedience to God. That's where you find completeness and purpose and joy. And that's where you find peace. Paul lived his entire life after salvation to glorify Jesus Christ. And Paul is basically saying, Lord, whichever way pleases you and whichever way is going to glorify you the most, let it be so. Let it be so. If it's going to glorify you the most, Lord, that I die a martyr for you, so be it. Equip me to be able to handle that. And if it's going to glorify you more for me to be alive for years to come and preach and teach, then so be it. Equip me to do that. Sometimes we make the mistake of believing that God's glory only comes through deliverance of our bad situations. But that's not always the case, is it? When people are sick, we pray for their healing if God wills it. But you know what else I pray? That they might glorify God in their illness. Is that not right? To pray that God might deliver them from them, their problems, but also that if God decides that it's his good will and intention to use those problems for his glory and their good, we yield and submit to God and to what is best in his eyes, not our own. We leave all that up to God. We don't tell God, hey God, by the way, here's how I think I can best glorify you. you we don't talk that way. We say, God, Glorify yourself through me in whatever way you choose. You bought me on the cross. I'm no longer my own. I am yours. My life is no longer mine. It is yours. I realize what you've saved me from. You have every right to me. Use me as you will. You leave how God uses you up to Him. He knows far better than you or I how to use you for His own glory and you're good. Verse 21 in Philippians 1. This ties right into what we were just saying. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which 
I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Yeah, heaven is far better. Verse 24, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul talks about death as a victory because for a Christian, it is. It is. It is the the doorway to glory. It is the way you get to heaven. It is gain for a Christian. If you die and go to heaven, you're gaining everything. It's not a loss. Jesus is your everything. Far better to live for Him then, who is your everything, and far better to go and be with Him. So death is is not a punishment. Death is a sweet release. Again, He longs to glorify God. His death could glorify God. That's a gain for him. It would also be a gain for Paul for him to be with the Lord forever and ever. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So Paul sees gain in death. He doesn't fear death. He doesn't fear death. He has a full blessed assurance of his salvation in Jesus Christ. Because he understands the gospel of salvation. And because he understands the gospel of salvation, he is able to rightly identify himself as being genuinely saved. And so therefore, he has no fear of death. Because for those who are genuinely saved, you go right into the presence of the Lord. And the Lord not only will bless you in that way, he will bless you in the sense that he will use your death to glorify himself, which is a good thing to you, Christian. Let my death and my life glorify you, Lord. Wring me out like a sponge. Leave nothing in me. Pour me out completely for you. In both my life and my death, may it be of service to you. Right? So Paul considers death a a gain. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like what Spurgeon said. He said, when men fear death... It is not certain that they are wicked, but it is quite certain that if they have faith, it is weak and in a sickly condition. This has been one of the greatest opportunities in our lifetimes to be able to effectively share the gospel with such people because of COVID and the fear of death that COVID ripped the veil away from people that we knew in our lives that you might have thought were Christians that you might have thought were genuinely assured of their own salvation and therefore had a confidence in that, and then you see how they react in such fear to something like COVID. And you say, whoa, that's not right. Or how many churches closed their doors in disobedience to the Lord's command to gather in assembly in worship and glorify. I mean, now that's the time when you need to be with believers more than ever. And you could have liquor stores open and you could have uh, other places open saying that these are open because they are a necessity. And then you close your church? What are you telling people? You're telling people that church is not a necessity. It's not as important as Walmart. When men fear death, it is not certain that they are wicked. But it is quite certain that if they do have faith, it is very weak and in a sickly condition if someone fears death and claims christ doesn't mean that they're necessarily unsaved but it does mean that they're either unsaved or that they have very weak faith sickly faith there's much of that to go around isn't there paul is quite the opposite if i live meaning physical life it will be to the fruit of my labor 
He doesn't say, if, I, if, if God chooses to let me live, man, I'm going to go on every vacation I've ever wanted to go. I'm going to get my bucket list done. He doesn't say that. His bucket list has changed. Everything's about Christ now. His whole life is now devoted to Christ. So Paul knows that if God keeps him alive and chooses to do that, he'll be fruitful. He'll be fruitful. And he also knows that if Paul, Paul knows that if God decides to let him die, that God will use that for his glory as well. What a confidence. Either way, he will help glorify God and bring more souls to Christ. So Paul admits, this is hard. This is hard. My death is a gain. I get to be with Christ forever. I can glorify Him in my death. But if I am still around, I can minister to you and watch you grow in Christ. So he has a strong desire to, to go and be with the Lord, which is right and good. But he doesn't even allow that to get in his way of service to the Lord. He says, I have a desire to go and be with you forever, Lord, but if it services you more, if it glorifies you more to keep me alive here longer, then so be it. What selflessness. What selflessness. And then you think back to the selflessness of Christ. And all that he gave up and all that he did for you and I, and you ask yourself, is there anything he can ask you that you don't owe him? We owe him everything. Everything. Paul gets it. Paul is no longer living for himself. He's living for Christ. And as Christians, that's the decision you're making when you pronounce faith in Jesus Christ. You're not just saying, I accept Jesus so that I get out of hell. And I can go to heaven. You're not just saying that. You're also saying that He is not just my Savior. He is my Lord. And He has a right over every part of me. My past, my present, my future are all His. To do with as He wishes. He is my Lord. It is no longer about my will, but His will be done. That's what you're saying when you are coming to faith in Christ. Many people don't understand that. They're just coming to Christ in the sense that they just don't want to go to hell. They're not coming to Christ because they want Him as their Lord and they want to give up all their sin and find repentance. No. But that is the true biblical Christianity. That is a true gospel. Even though Paul longed to be gone and be with the Savior forever in heaven, he acknowledges that let God's will be done and not His own. He knows that to be in heaven means no more sin, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more temptation. Perfection. Perfect service to the Lord. Perfect joy and rejoicing for all eternity and without end. He's going to see his brothers and sisters in heaven who had gone before him. He's going to be with Christ. And as close as as Paul was to God, he will be even closer in heaven, and so will we. But he understands that there are others who still need him. And he yields to God's will that his work was not yet done. But it's kind of nice, isn't it, to, to read of Paul saying, Ah, this is difficult for me. Ah, right? That's a very human thing. It's nice for us to be reminded that those who we read of in Scripture are very much human like you and me. Remember in Romans 7, Paul says, Ah, the very thing I don't want to do is the very thing I do, and the thing that I do is the very thing I don't want to do. Who's going to save me from this body of death? And each and every one who has been genuinely saved knows that feeling. Knows that. When, Paul, when, when Peter denies Christ and is then restored by Christ after his resurrection, we all know what it's like to fail our Savior. And as blubbering messes come to him on our knees and ask for his forgiveness and receive his restoration. 
So it's nice to know that, that the people that we read of in Scripture are just like us. They're not super Christians. They're just like you and me. Sharing the same Savior, sharing the same God, sharing the same Holy Spirit, just like you and me. As it happens, Paul doesn't know what's going to happen, but he will survive this imprisonment. He will end up being set free and then be martyred later in Rome. He was able to come and visit the Philippians again. He says that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. He knew that to come and visit them, would, they would both rejoice. Isn't that cool? He knew that if he came back to this congregation and he had such a close, close fellowship with, that both sides would rejoice in this. And that's exactly what happens. Verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Unity in the gospel. Unity in the gospel that we believe. Unity in the scriptures that preach of it. Unity in our need for the gospel. All of us share that same need, right? And then our unity in what our jobs are. You might make your money differently than I do. But we all share the same spiritual job. Share the gospel. Striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We are to live differently than the world around us. If you are preaching and teaching the gospel and what God's word says, you need to be living it. Duh! I mean, this is not rocket science. God is the God of all. He's sovereign. He saved me from sin and all. I could never thank Him in a million years. Let me tell you the gospel of Him. Yes, tell me of the gospel. And then you give them the gospel and afterwards they go, well, you know, doesn't it say in your Bible that you're not supposed to commit adultery and aren't you, aren't you seeing the secretary on the side? Didn't I see you at Applebee's making out together? Where has your gospel gone? Right? Can't just talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk first. And then you can talk the talk. We have that spirit of unity. We all need the gospel. We all are, are sinners at the, at the foot of the cross. Unity in the gospel and the need of salvation through Jesus Christ. Unity in the acceptance of God's word and the right handling of what it says. Unity in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Unity in the fact that our lives should be, when inspected, a worthy example of the gospel of Christ. Unity in the sense that we should be standing firm in one spirit striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. That's our goal. Talk to me more about the gospel and about your striving to live a life worthy of it. Don't, I, I would much rather have that conversation than we talk about who the Browns just drafted. I would much rather have that conversation than, oh, did you see how much gas is today? I, you know, this is, my, this is what drives me. This is my focus. This is my love. This is my everything. Christ. Christ is my everything. Let's talk about Him. Let's talk about that. So much so that no one has any doubt about what's most important to us. Christ. Christ. We must have unity together. We struggle along with each other in this strive for the gospel. You're not lone wolves. Never in Scripture is a believer referred to as a lone wolf, right? Sheep. Sheep. Sheep with a shepherd. Sheep are our flocks. We are meant to be around each other, meant to be striving and struggling along with each other, bearing each other's burdens, serving with one another. We are a team. We are a team. We have a shared goal. We have a shared gospel. We have a shared Savior. We have a shared Scripture. 
Everything about us is shared. We're a team. And we have the same goal. So we want our conduct to reflect our position as ambassadors of Christ, citizens of heaven, different and set apart from the world around us. So much so that people notice it. If you're not receiving any kind of blowback from this sinful world at all, it is probably because the world thinks you're one of them. You're not living enough for Christ. It's not apparent enough to the world around you, so they think you're one of them. Let me tell you, though, you can get into a big argument if you start talking to people about this or that and what the Gospel says. Certain hot-button issues that you'll avoid because, you know, let's just all get along. But we're a team. And we have the shared goal of sharing the Gospel and faith to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ above the comforts and conveniences of this life. So our conduct should reflect all of this. Paul wants to say, Paul is saying, I want to either hear that that's what's happening or get to see it for myself if God allows me to come and visit you. That you stay unified. In the gospel of Christ. Stay unified in the striving together for the gospel. That you keep perfecting it amongst yourselves and you keep proclaiming it to those who have never heard it. Or you keep correcting those who think they've heard it, but they've heard a false one. Verse 28 in Philippians 1. Not frightened in anything by your opponents, Because this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation that is from God. Do not be terrified. The idea here is like a stampede of horses. If you've ever been around a horse, they are large and powerful creatures. And if you had an entire herd of horses galloping towards you at full speed, you would be terrified. You're standing on the ground. You have no way of avoiding them. It would terrify you. And Paul is saying here, do not let anything terrify you. Instead, be courageous. Be bold. Be strong in the Lord. When when a Christian is able to stand firm in the midst of any situation, any persecution, anything that the world can throw at it, that is a sign to the world of their impending destruction. If you stand firm like Paul is doing in this regard, then it is a sign to the world around them that in spite of all the destruction and and perdition and difficulty that can be thrown upon you, you stand firm. There is something inside of those who are not saved, that tells them that this is a sign of their own destruction. That they will waste away. When Christians stand strong against the world, when Christians stand strong against their own flesh, when Christians stand strong against Satan, it shows our enemies that their destruction is certain. That's really what it shows. Because they have failed. Satan has failed. Your flesh has failed. The world has failed to destroy you and pull you away from Christ. That's all they got. All the world has, and all that Satan has, is fear of death. Fear of death. I will intimidate you and try and strike the fear of death into you in order to get you to fall and fail. But what happens when you run into someone who is a genuine Christian, who the Lord has matured enough to see that there is no fear in death, only gain? What, left, what weapon is left of the world or the devil to throw at you? Nothing. When you don't fear death, there's nothing. You can't be bought or sold. There's nothing. There's nothing. I don't fear death. Nothing you offer me is greater than the offer of God in heaven. You've got nothing. You've got nothing. Kill me and I live forever. What what is, uh, people who like Star Wars, what's Obi-Wan Kenobi say right before Darth Vader swipes him down, right? 
Strike me down and I'll become more powerful than you could possibly imagine. Well, kind of like that. Go ahead, kill me. You're just sending me to my reunion with my Lord and Savior who I love more than anyone and anything. Go ahead and strike me down because I will not change my faith and this will inspire others to follow me in the faith. So you're really not doing any good here whatsoever. To live is Christ. If you live, you're living for Christ. If you die, it's a gain. This is radical. This is not. This shouldn't be radical to the Christian church today, but it is, unfortunately. That to live is Christ. Your life is all about Christ. You can't get enough of Christ. You want to talk about Christ and how you're praying for Him to move in your own life and the life of your loved ones and the life of your coworkers, and the life of your neighbors. Everything's about Christ. That's, that's, your, that's your talking points. What do you want to talk about today? Christ. Right? That, I mean, that is how we should be thinking. We should never be terrified by any of our adversaries. It's evidence of our own salvation when stuff comes against you and you're not terrified. This is what we were talking about earlier about COVID. How many people that we saw just go into terror mode because of COVID, yet you're telling me you're a Christian? You, some, there's a disconnect there. Something's not right. Either you have a weak faith or a weak understanding of what salvation is or you're not saved. Because death should not fear, you should not fear death in such a way. Because again, if you're living, you're living for Christ and not yourself. And if you die, it's a gain, not a loss. Paul really shows us the way that we should live in any situation, including imprisonment. Verse 29 and 30. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. You throw that at every uh, prosperity teacher. Okay? With that false prosperity gospel. You throw them that verse. Philippians 1.29 For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Christ, but also suffer for Christ. For His sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. First off, it's granted to the Philippians to believe in Christ. It's a gift. It's granted. You can't get there on your own. It must be granted. That's how we pray, right? Lord, please grant that you would open the eyes and ears of my loved one, my neighbor, my enemy. That they might see and believe, hear and believe the Gospel, right? In the same way that that's granted... Belief is granted in Christ. You know, so belief is a gift and it's granted to us. And in that same way, it is also granted to us to suffer for the cause of Christ. This is something that is granted. Granted. In other words, you and I need to look at suffering for Christ as a privilege. It's a privilege. Because you trust that God is sovereign and He has you exactly where He wants you, exactly when He wants you, and how He wants you. Just like Paul's doing. He's rejoicing. He's talking about all the opportunity that his imprisonment has given him to share the gospel. Right? He's not saying, oh, woe is me. I can't believe this is happening to me. You know, maybe God's not real. Maybe Christ isn't all in all. He's not saying any of that stuff. He's saying God is sovereign. God is great. God holds everything in the palm of His hand. And that same God has me here for such a time as this. And even though I'm in prison, I'm in perfect will of God. I'm in the perfect will of God no matter where I am because this is where God wanted me to be. So now I'm going to look around for every opportunity that I have to serve Him and glorify Him no matter where I'm at. No matter what circumstance, even if it's suffering, I will do that for the glory of God. I'll share the gospel for the glory of God. I will suffer for the glory of God. When God blesses me with good things, I will do that for the glory of God. But even to suffer for Him is a good thing if it brings Him glory, yes? In our sermon series on heaven, we talked about how you look forward to serving God in heaven, yes? And even more so when you realize that you'll finally be able to serve Him sinlessly and perfectly 
for all time. Like that, yes, I want to I want to give back. I want to serve you and worship you and I want to do that in perfection, perfect, perfectly done in perfection and enjoyed in perfection. So we long to serve God here just like we long to serve God in heaven. And let me tell you, there's one way of serving God here that you'll never be able to do in heaven and that's to serve him even in the midst of suffering. This is why this is granted to you. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. That's why the apostles were like, thank you for blessing us with the privilege to suffer for your sake. It's a privilege. We have the problem of we are so self-centered. We are so self-absorbed. It's about me, myself, and I and how God can help me and da-da-da-da-da. No, it's all about Christ, Christ, Christ. It's all about God. We long to serve Him here. We long to serve Him perfectly in heaven. And we recognize that to serve God here might involve suffering. And if it does, we do that to His glory as well. Knowing that there's only a certain amount of time that we're called to suffer for the cause of Christ. And then once we get to eternity, never again. Our present difficulties, even Paul's, granted to us. Paul's difficulty granted to him. Not as punishment. Not as punishment. Paul is in imprisonment in Rome, not as a punishment to him, but as a tool in the Almighty God's hands. What a change of thinking. I'm not where I'm at because of punishment. I'm at where I'm at because God wants to use me as a tool in his hand. Now you can see how you can rejoice. Now you can see how you can say, God, no matter where I'm at, help me to be used by you for your glory. Physical, spiritual, persecution, God knows how to equip His people for such things. God knows what you can handle and what you can't. And if God pushes you past the point of what you can handle, which He often does, He will be faithful to equip you for whatever the ordeal might be. I don't remember who said it, but somebody said, the master has to select with careful scrutiny the branches that can stand the knife. God knows. And if God has ordained it to happen where you're going to suffer for His sake, guess what? He's not just going to leave you there in your own strength. No, of course not. You'll be able to look up and see that He has granted you everything needed to serve Him well in every hour, whether it be an hour of agony or an hour of persecution or an hour of rejoicing. Philippians had conflict just like Paul had. They were being persecuted just like Paul was. And they have to be encouraged to continue to walk in the the Spirit, to continue to walk in the ways of the Lord and proclaiming the Gospel in spite of being under constant attack. Constant. Conflict all the time. Like you just get hardened to it. You need to be strengthened by this. And this is what Paul is doing. And God was using that to bless his church as well. Not only is he sharing the gospel in Rome with people he never would have been able to beforehand, not only does he have the time to write all these letters that strengthen the church, but by Paul's faithfulness, God is using that to inspire and bring courage to the rest of the church that is experiencing persecution. The Philippians can look at Paul and see his faithfulness and see how God is using him in spite of his current situation to glorify himself and grow the church and see how Paul finds the joy in that. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that all these things we read about, unity, proclaiming the gospel, 
joy in the midst of trial and persecution. All these things are equipped and given to us by you. And Lord, we pray that you would give us the kind of faith and trust in you that rejoices in any situation, knowing that it is you who have put us there and that you will faithfully take care of us no matter where you lead us. You will never forsake us or abandon us. But that we would have the kind of faith that stands out like a light on top of a hill, salt in an otherwise uh, saltless world. That you would use us, Lord, to... And help us to be bold in the proclamation of your gospel. That we would find joy in every situation and ways to glorify you and live for you and share your gospel in every situation. Equip us to be such people, Lord, for your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.